Good to have you all here tonight. Uh, bless you. Uh, for those who are just now joining us, I'm sorry that you missed today. We saw three souls accept Christ as Savior today so far. And three present themselves for baptism, and we will be having baptism next Sunday night. Uh, I, I uh, checked with Mom. And she says, oh, I'm feeling so much better now. I said, okay, well, just be careful. We'll see you about six weeks back to church. She said, oh, no. No, 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 no. And uh, she wants to extend her love for all the people who've called her, sent cards and text messages. She said it's really been an uplifting thing for her. And so uh, thank you. Uh, the book of Isaiah. Now this message, again, I want to explain to you. There are some messages that I, I believe that we need often. And this is one of them. Uh, every year or uh, every year and a half, two years, I think we need it. It just keeps us in memory. And in January, every January, I, I try to use to, again, inspire from the Word of God, inspire us to greatness. Because we've got a new year and a, a new opportunity. And so you're going to hear messages, on, on, as always, what God has done for us, but also our responsibility back to God. Because if you're saved, you do have a responsibility. Not that you are working for your salvation or you're trying to sustain your salvation. No. But we need to give it our all because of our salvation. And so, uh, uh, again, these are, these are messages I, I, I just I want us to take hold of and, and ponder on them and, and rehearse them in our hearts that we can be all that we can be for the Lord. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, starting in verse 1, In the year of Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up his train, filled the, the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. With twain he did fly. And one cried unto, up, uh, unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved as the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe, it's me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphims unto me, having a live colt in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs of from off the altar, he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell these people, Hear ye indeed, the under and understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of these people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and convert and be healed. Father, now as we again open up your words tonight, these, these scriptures are familiar to us. It's not that they haven't been preached, but Lord, Sometimes we need to rehearse. We can keep us where we need to be. Thank you for your word. Let he, the Holy Spirit, teach us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. In anything that there's, there's, uh, has something to do with, there are always fundamentals. In football, I don't care if you're playing in peewee league, to the pros, the very first part of, of getting back together, they run over fundamentals. And fundamentals are important. Fundamentals need to be known so well that they, became, they become an action of ours. 
uh, when I was when I was playing football in the backfield and everything, uh, the hardest thing to learn is when I went to my right of how to go to the right. And when I went to my left, how to go to the left. I, I didn't realize until I got in organized sports there was a way to do it. Before, I'd just twist and run. But the, they were so hard on me, yet today I remember. And many times when I walk, I still do it. But as a, as a running back, your first step is not with your left foot going across. Your first step is this. Or on your left step, your first step is not to turn like this and run this way. That's not fun. Your, your step is this. And then you walk. Fundamentals. When you receive a ball, your, your first move, if you're going to the right, your arm's like this because it's open. If you do this, you're going to knock the ball out. And so on and so forth, okay? Those are fundamentals. Uh, when you receive a ball, you, you hit your stride, and then you keep your eye on the ball, and then let your hands go to what your eye see. You keep the eye on the ball. Basketball. There are ways to go up and do layups. And uh, uh, if you don't have it right, the ball's going to bounce around and stuff. Even professionals, they have a hard time with fundamentals at the line. Of nobody contesting them or anything, just sitting there throwing a free shot. And many times, because uh, even though they're pros, the reason why it doesn't go in is because their fundamentals are wrong. And uh, so you practice the fundamentals. You 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 rehearse them. You rehearse them. Uh, baseball, they teach you about uh, uh, hitting the ball. You know, to me, they say, well, he bats 300, so out of every 10, he only hits three of them. That doesn't sound very good, but in baseball, that I guess that's pretty good. But uh, one thing, baseball, they teach you, keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye on the ball. You're not going to hit the ball unless you see the ball. Uh, when you're catching a ball, you've got to keep your eye on the ball. If you take your eye off the ball, you're going you're gonna to miss it. And so, final minutes, I don't care whether you, you're just starting out or... I don't, uh, you've been doing this for years. There are fundamentals that we've got to rehearse in our Christian faith. And this is, I believe, is a fundamental. Now, we know from this book of Isaiah, if you'll look in chapter 1, verse, uh, verses 1 through uh, 6a, he talks about the, the children of Israel going backwards. My friends, you don't gain anything going backwards. You lose. It just drives me nuts when I watch sport and somebody to try to go forward will run backwards. And it just aggravates the daylights out of me. You're not going forward if you're going backwards. You remember that. And then in chapter 5, verses 1 uh, through 7, it talks about the vineyard and how God makes the vineyard nice and everything, but through carelessness, we can let the vineyard get overgrown and then tore down, and that's not good. And then in chapter 5, verses 20 and 23, you see where the people now become, are saying that evil's good and good is evil. Well, we live in that age today. That is, that is a craziness, but that's what they do. And then we see in this uh, chapter 5, verse 25, we see the anger of the Lord. So I would like for you to uh, this evening after church to read chapters 1 through 5, and I think it will be a blessing to you. But Isaiah gets a glimpse of heaven, and he sees the Lord on the throne, and what a sight that must be. I think if each and every one of us could ha just have a glimpse into heaven and see the Lord on the throne, I can't think or help believing that it would leave an indelible mark in our mind that would burn our mind. And yet we see him in God's word there. And we don't let it uh, have an effect on us like I think maybe it should have an effect on us. But uh, we see the seraphims and we see how they, uh, how they are. They have the wings and two covers the face, two covers their feet and one and two of them fly. I can only imagine what they look like. I, I, I can't even imagine. I really can't. I've seen pe artists 
uh, writings on them and stuff like that, and I, I just don't think they're even getting close to doing them justice. But, but one says to the other, holy, holy, holy. And, you know, I, I don't think there's any, uh, any reason to think any other thing than this. He says, holy, holy, holy three times because there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, they are God and they are holy. Amen? And so we, we see this. I think about the poet that, that put together the, the words uh, for a song. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. And I tell you, the majesty of God and the holiness of God. The first word we see here is woe. Woe. In verse 5, it says this. He said, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. As I see this woe, I see a humble soul. And again, I want to remind you of this. Because when we do things in humility, fundamental. If we do things in humility and love for God, things go a lot better. When pride intervenes into our heart, oh, our life gets so much worse in a, such a quick way. And uh, uh, I, I see the humbleness of soul. He has just now looked into heaven and seen the throne there and the majesty of that and everything. And how else would a person think of themselves if you got a glimpse into heaven? Let me ask you. What would you think of yourself? If you got a glimpse into heaven and you saw the majesty of God, what, what attitude or what, what, uh, what uh, uh, thought would you have of yourself? I think you'd see yourself for what you are, a creation of God, and He is so much worthy. Amen? And so we, we see this. He says, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. He says, I dwell in the midst of people with unclean lips. Don't you think that this was burdensome to him? Don't you think this was something that weighed hard upon his heart? First of all, he looked into himself. And I believe each and every one of us ought to look into ourselves before we look out into others. We need to make sure that we are in the position with God that we should be in before we start looking at others. And we do this on a daily basis, and maybe on an hour by hour. And sometimes we have to look at ourselves minute by minute. But I'm telling you this, when you see heaven and you think about the righteousness of God and the holiness of God, we need to understand that, yes, we are undone. And if there's anything done in our life, it's because of His mercy towards us. And then it'll give you a heart for those outside. just kills me, just kills me the condition of mankind. It thrills me three people accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior today. But don't you realize there's so many more that need our Jesus in our community? Don't you understand that in the, in the town surrounding our little community that there are many in that, those communities that need Jesus, and they think they're okay, and I understand that, because the information they're working off of, maybe they, they would feel like they're okay. But this, the Word of God teaches us that we're all undone, and we're all unholy, and we're all great sinners in the eyes of the Lord, and our righteousness are as filthy rags, and, and our hearts are despicable and deceitful, and, and, and uh, continual uh, evil proceeds out of it. That we need Jesus as our Savior. He knew the people that surrounded him. They were called God's children, but yet they didn't act like God's children. They were called God's children, yet they forsook the one that called him them his. It was a sad state of affairs for sure. He says that... His eyes have seen the Lord. And when we stand before Christ in totally sold out condition, how unworthy are we still? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you have been more spiritual than you are at this very moment? In your life, how many of you 
have been, ever been more spiritual than what you are right now. For many, I think many would say, I have been more spiritual than what I am right now. Then we have a need tonight. We have a cause tonight. The Bible tells us that when we stand before God, He looks at us through His will, His lifestyle, that He wants for us, not our desires and what we think's right. He looks at us through the the uh, judgment and the and the rule of how do we measure up to what He wants. You say, preacher, there is no way that we can measure up to what He wants. Oh, but I tell you something. I believe we can we can do the best that we can. And I think I think God will use us the closer we get to we, when we measure up the way He wants us to be. You know in your life when you're serving God and you are really serving Him, how God uses you. Man, I tell you what, the the uh, the water of God flows out and and you're able to talk to people and, and it seems like that you have success. You say, why is that? Because you're walking with the Lord. Again, let me remind you, don't be prideful and think it's you doing something great. But remember this, it's God doing something through you. And when your life is clean, and when the Lord can work in you and through you, the work can be done more in a, a uh, easier fashion. It's like, it's like sometimes... We wonder why we're not able to be the witness that we desire to be. Well, maybe we're a little dirty inside. We have the Word of God that will filter and, and the Holy Spirit that will filter and get all that junk out of us and, and make us where we can be uh, better witnesses for Him and better Christians. But we keep ourselves all gooped up. So he said, whoa. He understood his position with God. In verse 6, he said, Lo, then flew one of the serpents unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. This brings us to a remembrance that God does want us clean. He does want us uh, to where we can be used. Lo is, is, is something, is a, is a word that express a, a, a call to attention. Lo, I'm calling you to attention. Or it's an expression of, of wonder or surprise. And, and when he said lo, he, he says, okay, you know your setting, but... but now let me help you with this. I want to call your attention to something. If we're going to be sanctified, and I believe everybody ought to have a sanctified life, a life that's set apart to God and away from evil. But if we're going to have a sanctified a life, it's actually going to come from God. As the angels came and took the coal off the altar and touched His lips, which was showed a, a, a purging, a cleaning, so we, in our lives, we go to God's throne, maybe through an altar, or the altars at our home, or uh, through our time of fellowship with the Lord, and we give ourselves over to Him, and He in return, He in return respects what we're doing, and He helps us reach that place we need to be in our life. Say, preacher, it's hard sometimes. Don't I know it? Don't I know it? I mean, some days it just seems so easy, and other days it seems so hard. Why do you think those days when it seems so hard? Why do you think it's hard? Don't all talk at one time. I won't understand you. Sometimes it's because we're out of God's will. Sometimes. Anybody else? If you're in God's will, the devil will
will fight you. He doesn't want you doing anything for the Lord. He'll try to put something in as a stumbling block, something to discourage you, something to anger you, something to make you think, well, what's the use? I'm telling you what, my friends, as long as we have air in our body and we have, we have our mind about us, I tell you, it, there, is, there is a reason. And it, it's a good reason. It's, it's for the furtherance of the gospel. And so he said, he said, lo. He said, lo. God calls us tension through, through the Holy Spirit, the shortness in our life. How many knows all their shortnesses in their life that you have that's keeping you from uh, being what you ought to be for God? Come on, how many? Some of you say, well, I'm not going to raise my hand. Okay, let's do it this way. How many wives know their husband's shortness in their life that's keeping them from being 100% for the Lord? Okay. How many, how many men know the shortcomings in your wives? Yeah. <laughs> we, got, we got a hunter. It, he, he's carrying his double barrel here. Yeah. How many of you kids know the shortcomings in your parents' lives is keeping them 100% for the Lord? Yeah. How many of you parents know your kids' shortcomings in their life is keeping them 100% for the Lord? You see, we do know. We do know. And the, the difference is, is Isaiah said, Okay, Lord shortcomings. I'm going to work on it. Folks, they just didn't happen in. We let them in. They just didn't stay because, because they just immediately rooted. We watered it and let it root in our heart, in our soul. Already, the weeds are starting to come out into the yards Already, I'm already talking about Roundup. Kill the weeds that are green right now so I don't have to fight them and then fight the weeds that come during the other parts of the year. Because once they get roots, then you got a battle on your hands. Those of you who have gardens, you have to work them all the time if you're going to keep them weed-free. Well, I tell you what, the gardens that we've grown, uh, they look beautiful. We get the rakes out. We'll even get a torch out and burn the grass and stuff. But if you don't go out there every day and dig before long, it's going to overcome the garden. After a rain, what do you do? You better get out there because I tell you something's getting ready to grow and it's not your vegetables. It's those shortcomings. And so you have to put out effort to bring them out. And my friends, you are the ones here tonight that want to do great things for God. You're here tonight. Except for you who are sick, truly sick, and want to be here. But even then, we have to work on ourselves. Those things we know that aren't right in our life, we've got to make them right. Those things that we're doing that they say, well, it's okay, it's okay. If it's not okay in the Word of God, it's not okay in our lives, my friend. You've got to keep that in your mind. You can't justify those things that are wrong. You've got to fight it. You've got to fight it. He said, lo. Sinner iniquity is taken away here in the low. He takes it away. And then lastly tonight, he says, go. You know, funny thing about this tonight, it's still the same question God's still asking. We know he asked it of Jonah. Jonah went, did he not? He went the long way around, but he went. Isn't that right? You know what was, what was nice about using God as an example? 
God didn't take the long way around. You know what God did? God said to God, it's time for you to go. And so he left heaven. He was born. Those 30, 33 years, God said to God, or if you want to talk the way David talked, my Lord said to my Lord, Go. My Lord went. My Lord said to my Lord, Now it's time to take up the cross that mankind can be saved. My Lord didn't act like Jonah. My Lord didn't act like Peter and denied. You know what my Lord did? When God said go, He go. He go. Knowing what was going to happen to Him. But what happened to Him made something happen in my life made something happen in your life. When that happened in your life, God said, go and let it happen in somebody else's life. Don't let the devil trick you and tell you you can't go because of COVID. That's a lie. They told us we couldn't have church because of COVID. We found out that was a lie. They tell us we can't go see our loved ones because of COVID. They don't want our loved ones to get COVID, and yet they bring it in themselves. Not on purpose. But they still get COVID. Why can't we have our people and love on them? You know why? Because the devil loves separation of people to people. He loves it because you then become discouraged and depressed. And when you become discouraged and depressed, you quit doing things physically. And when you quit doing things physically, you quit doing things for God. How does a socialist government take over? <laughs> but how are they doing it? Huh? Taking away the family. What else? Yes, one step at a time, but what are they doing? And it's for your safety. You stay in. Don't go out. If you're, not, if you're staying in and not going out, what are you not doing? You're not socializing. You're not socializing. You're not around people. You become isolated. What did we say Satan wants everybody to do? To isolate. What did those jokers up in New York tell the people? If you see somebody doing something we told them not to do, you let us know. We'll take care of it. So now everybody's looking at each other not knowing who to trust. They become isolated. Afraid somebody will see him do something and they will isolate them and judge them. Now, who does that sound like? Sounds a whole lot like Satan. If you believe that you can't go out and tell somebody about Jesus, you're believing a lie. I said we're going to be going out doing door-to-door again. 
I understand that there will be some that won't open their doors. They'll be inside. But you know what? They're going to see us on their door looking out. We will leave, if nothing else, a gospel trap in the door. And when they go get it, whether they read it or not, up to them. <coughs> but they're going to know somebody cares for them. Whether they understand it or not, they will know somebody made the effort to go out. How other way than that did God tell us to build his church. He took the disciples and said, go we out, two by two. Go. Go out. Tell people about Jesus. They've got some people so afraid to get out, they have their groceries delivered. They're afraid to come to church. They sit in their house. They're depressed. They don't know what to do. You know what will help them the most? To get out, come to church, and see their family. That's what will help them. Say, preacher, you're no doctor. The science, the science. Understand the science. And I understand there is many doctors that's against what's going on as there are who for them. But it's like everything else. They won't let those doctors speak. Why? That's right. What does Satan want to do to Christians? Silence him. Let's just don't let him speak. A free America. We have the right to share God. We have the right to go. And if we don't take it one of these days, we'll be doing it with an understanding that you do it. It's going to be a penalty for it. Say it never happened. What happened to the early church? They took their properties. That's how the word of God got all over the world. These people left their country to go to another. And when they went, they just took the Lord with them. The devil will attack you from all ways to keep you from doing what you should do. The question is, what are you going to do? Whoa? Low? Go? Say, preacher, it doesn't make a difference. If this continues the way it's continuing right now, one of these days, these doors will be shut. And you're crazy if you, don't, if you think any different. I live in America. Russia used to have freedom. They don't. Germany, they tried it, failed miserably. And when the walls came down, even though they could move across. Now listen to me. Even though that they could move across freely from East Germany to West Germany, you know what those people did? They got out of that hole and went to West Germany. Just in case they get stuck back behind a wall again. My friends, Satan will try to enslave us. He will do it to you as an individual, and he will try to do it to you 
us as a church. You say, well, it'll take a lot longer being in middle America. Once it starts to rumble, my friends, it will go faster than what you think. You say, the Lord's going to come. Yes, He is. Well, this is an exciting time because it just means the Lord's coming back sooner than what we expected. I don't know. I expected Him last week. How much sooner is it than that? You say, well, we'll just have to put up with it two years. I don't like to put up with anything for two years. And I'm talking about putting up with it. Now, I can eat a bowl of ice cream for two years. I'm not putting up with it. I'm enjoying it. You say, preacher, after all these people pass, it will all go back. They're teaching the young people how to hate God. When they used to teach them how to love God, Brother Coleman, senior, wanted to sing uh, God Bless America. It's not even in our psalm books. Can you believe that's not even in our psalm books? So in Sunday school, we sing God Bless America. I wonder how many young people honestly know the words to God Bless America. Raise your hand if you know the words to God Bless America. I'm young people. All the older people, you're not young. Isn't that strange? In grade school, every morning, we had a scripture read to us and we sang God Bless America. We also sang this song. This land is your land. This land is my land. How many remember that song? How many of you young folks know the words to that? Do you, you girls know it? Do you know it? Did you sing it in a, uh, a uh, assembly? Yeah, that's how you know it. Okay. I'm glad you know it. But they can, I went to my granddaughter's deal. And they sang songs of foreign lands, which I think is great. Didn't understand it. But hey. But that old song, Randy, leads the choir. Sing me an old gospel song, a song about Jesus. Huh? Sing me an old gospel song. I'll surely be grateful if you take the time. I know it won't take very long to sing me my favorite. Sing me an old gospel song. You see where we're going, folks? You see why the fundamentals are so important to look at and rehash and rehash and rehash? I'm going to ask you this question right before we stand and bow our heads in prayers. You're going to say, I just heard this. But have you ever been more spiritual than you are at this very moment? And if you have, give it to Jesus. Let's all stand with our head bowed and our eyes closed. Lord, I know sometimes we feel that...